Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dental CE Academy. I'm Dr. Kirsten Rowling. I'm the Chief Education Officer here, and I'll be presenting this course today on hypochlorous acid, non-toxic disinfection to safeguard your dental practice against superbug contamination. This course is recorded. It is on demand. Um, if you are looking for the live course, please go back to our website, dentalceacademy.com, to the live tab, and you'll see the future live courses that will be presented on this topic and others. This presentation today was not sponsored. I have not received a speaker's honorarium and there has been no corporate entity that has influenced the content of this presentation today. And any mention of products that I may make today would be for general information only. CE credit instructions, again, this is a recording. So please drop below the video player that you're watching now Go to the instructions section. Number three is the quiz. Number two is the handout. And you'll complete that quiz directly from our website. You'll need 80% passing score seven days to complete. You have unlimited attempts. And there is a link there for you should you need assistance with CE credit. We're talking today about hypochlorous acid. And in order to do that, especially around the uh, content of disinfection, I'd like to give you some background information about disease transmission as well as cross-contamination and then surface disinfection. And then we'll jump into hypochlorous acid. So the chain of infection here is important to review. And this is a very good graphic from the Texas Health and Human Services. We need to disrupt one or more of these links in the chain of infection to stop or at least slow down uh, disease transmission, and it always starts with a pathogen. So bacteria, virus, fungi, parasite, we need a reservoir that can be human, animal, soil, food, or water. We need a portal of exit. We need a way for that pathogen to escape its host and a mode of transmission. So portal of exit can be coughing, sneezing, bodily secretions, feces, and notice in that mode of transmission, the hands because the hands are the number one mode of transmission. So if someone is coughing, sneezing, um, using the restroom, not washing their hands well, that is a primary source of cross-contamination that we'll talk about today. So mode of transmission can be through direct contact with patient care as well as indirect contact and then vectors would be um, animals, insects, that sort of thing. Portal of entry is a way for that pathogen to re-enter a new host. That can be the mouth, nose, eyes, cuts in the skin, and then we need a susceptible host. We need someone who is not immune to the infection caused by this pathogen. And that can really be anyone, but we do have some populations that are at greater risk. That can be older adults, it can be infants, um, and those that are in immunocompromised. So when we talk about elements of effective surface disinfection. Um, they should include, again, effective hand hygiene, reduced aerosol and improve the indoor air quality with adequate HVAC filtration, UVC. Use disinfectants that are correct for the purpose, that are safe, they persist, and they're effective against superbug contamination. And we will talk about hypochlorous acid today because that is your number one go-to disinfectant in your dental practice to provide you with all of these benefits and more as we'll see. Use disinfectants that are safe for your team. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Of course, training should be ongoing and evaluation. Why is effective surface disinfection important? Well, because we know that contamination of the environmental surfaces serve as a reservoir for microbial dissemination and certainly for antimicrobial resistance. Um, organisms that we are concerned about, of course, could be SARS-CoV-2, monkeypox, or mpox, herpes viruses, uh, herpes simplex 1 and 2, um, hepatitis B and C, HIV, Clostridium difficile, MRSA, multiple species of staphylococci, streptococci, um, and of course, other uh, multi-drug resistant organisms and other oral respiratory viruses and bacteria. Numerous pathogens colonize the oral cavity and the nasal cavity 
as well as the respiratory tract, and they have the potential to be disseminated both directly and indirectly throughout the dental treatment area. And we're concerned, of course, about our environmental surfaces, our clinical, as well as housekeeping surfaces, because they serve as a reservoir for microbial dissemination to dental personnel, patients, instruments, devices, equipment, and other environmental surfaces. The longer these organisms remain on surfaces, the higher the chance of additional contamination and or disease transmission. Prevention of transmission of infections from contaminated surfaces is accomplished by the reduction of any source of contamination. So cross-contamination is a huge concern in dental practices. When we talk about healthcare-associated infections, we're talking about infections that can, can occur in a hospital setting, uh, medical clinic, ambulatory care center, outpatient settings, including dental practices. And then we're gonna talk a little bit later about community-associated infections, which really zero in on outpatient um, uh, infections. So reducing the degree of contamination on our environmental surfaces in our dental treatment areas lessen the probability of cross-infection and disease transmission. So contamination of the patient environment by bacteria, viruses, fungi, frequently been associated with healthcare associated infections that occur in a wide range of healthcare settings. So improving the environmental surface cleaning and disinfection is integral to preventing disease transmission um, in our practices and reducing healthcare associated infections. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health right now. And this is a course that I also teach on our platform and many resistant microorganisms cause infections that result in significant morbidity and mortality on a global scale. One of the most significant contributing factors in the spread of infection or resistant infections include Clostridium difficile, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, as well as other drug resistant organisms. And the contributing factor that I wanna talk about today and why we're all here is non-compliance with recommended infection control practices. So the CDC estimates that there are more than 2 million people in the US that are sickened every year because of an antibiotic resistant infection. I happen to be one of those and you'll hear my story here in a little bit. At least 23,000 Americans die yearly from an antibiotic resistant infection. What do we mean by that? Well, we know as soon as 10 years ago even, patients that um, became infected with pneumonia, some bacterial pneumonia infections could be treated with antibiotics, but we know now we're running out of antibiotics. Um, these bacteria becoming resistant and someone that could have been treated with an antibiotic may develop an infection with a pathogen that was that is resistant to antibiotics and they don't respond and they may not survive that infection. So the numerous organisms that we're concerned about that are antibiotic resistant, certainly Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is one of the CDC's top four antibiotic or antimicrobial resistant uh, pathogens with the largest death rate, as well as the second greatest caseload in the US, right? More people die of Clostridium difficile in the US um, than other countries. And we have about 30,000 that we lose yearly to C. difficile, about half those cases are antibiotic resistant. Of course, Ciaris, um, and there are others here, fluconazole resistant, candida, vancomycin resistant, enterococcus, um, and certainly methicillin resistant, staphylococcus aureus, and so forth. So I want you to ask yourself, is your surface disinfectant sporicidal? Now, if you are using wipes in your practice and they may be cavicide wipes 
or others, they are quaternary ammonium compounds. And about 90 to 95% of dental practices are using quaternary ammonium compound wipes, but they are not sporicidal. They will not kill Clostridium difficile spores, for instance. And we're going to see why we need to be concerned about Clostridium difficile spores. Now, in your handout, you are going to find information about quaternary ammonium compounds. And we're seeing more and more information about the toxicity of quaternary ammonium compounds. And that includes the wipes that we're using right now. There is a link to that study. And concerns include the following effects. Effects on the dermal system, respiratory, immune, reproduction, developmental, metabolic, and environmental impact. Despite widespread use and environmental releases of these quarks to the environment, most have not undergone rigorous regulatory assessment for potential adverse human and ecological health effects. In fact, the most basic parameters needed to assess their potential for harm, such as quantitative data on uses and volumes, physicochemical properties, exposure and toxicity are lacking for the majority of these compounds. And again, uh, that is a direct quote from this publication and the link is there for you. So we spoke about healthcare associated um, infection. We're gonna zero in now on community associated C. difficile infections. And community, I'm sorry, C. difficile or uh, Clostridium difficile now known um, to be caused primarily by antibiotics. But many of us may have been trained in dental school to believe that the patient was a carrier similar to an opportunistic infection. They have the Clostridium difficile spores within their um, intestinal tract already. They were given an antibiotic. It disrupted their colonization resistance. They're no longer able to fight off this pathogen. In fact, a niche is created and the pathogen C. diff takes over. The fact is that carriers, which I've just described, represent 0.4 to 15% of the general population. The concern really is contamination of the environment. And I'm going to show you a quick video here on six experts. And these experts are going to talk to you about how one actually gets Clostridium difficile. And this is a presentation by Contagion. And these six experts are experts in the realm of infectious diseases, as well as um, Clostridium difficile and other pathogens, antimicrobial pathogens and so forth, antimicrobial resistant pathogens. Now, I want you to note that they're talking about outpatient settings and they're talking about when we give patients antibiotics and we invite those patients back into a contaminated environment, and note they're going to call out dental practices, this is the recipe for how one gets C. difficile. And many of you may not have been aware of that. Again, many of us are trained to think that C. difficile is caused by a patient who is a carrier who has received antibiotics. And those antibiotics place the patient um, at risk and those antibiotics created a niche for which those C. difficile spores take over. But we know now that the patients um, come into contact with contamination and I'm going to go ahead and play this video for you right now. So again, this is contagion and I wanna make sure that I give them the proper due. And notice again, they're going to call out dental practices. And also they're going to talk very briefly about how difficult it is to kill these spores. And again, our quaternary ammonium compounds and our dental practices 
don't kill these spores. So let's talk about community C. diff if we could for a moment. Uh, uh, what are the risk factors in, in the community and how do they differ in the community versus the, the hospital-based uh, population here? Dale, you want to start us on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good uh, question because um, there's two factors that we need to have in order to get C. diff. One is antibiotic use and the other is uh, exposure to the spores. So the spores are ubiquitous. They're out in the environment. They even contaminate at a very low level some foods, meats, uh, root vegetables, lettuce, and those are probably how patients in the community get exposed. They, um, on the other hand, uh, when the CDC has looked at community-associated C. diff, they found that about 80% of these patients have had an exposure to healthcare as an outpatient. So it's doctor's office, dental office, and uh, you know, chronic dialysis units, uh, ambulatory surgery. And this is where you have two risks. One is that somebody's going to give you an antibiotic and that those are called doctors. And, uh, <laughs> and we they, hope it's only they, they, they put people at risk of C. diff. And, uh, and the other exposure is that the healthcare environment is more contaminated with C. diff spores than is the environment outside of healthcare. And I, I think it's worth noting, Paul, Paul is nodding his head, he has a lot of nodding. <laughs> uh, it's not just the people who are in the healthcare system. It's not just the people who got the antibiotics. They go home, they've got spores, and then their families are exposed. So uh, it seems to me that that's, that's part of the, the issue, isn't it? And those, yeah, spores, yes. those spores can live for a significant period of time on many different surfaces, even when exposed to sunlight. And you know, you'll see some data that says, alcohol and certain um, certain products can kill the spores, but that it really has to be used properly where they where the, the liquid sits on a surface for a significant period of time to have its effects. So the fact that the spores can be taken home with you on your lab coat and, and in your house and on your on surfaces for six months or a year or longer uh, certainly put people at risk. Okay, and there's a link there for you, uh, the video as well. So again, this was a study that indicated that 80% of those infected with community associated C. difficile infections had some exposure to a healthcare outpatient setting, including dental practices. And we know these C. difficile spores are everywhere in the natural environment. They're nearly impossible to kill and they can follow you home, putting your family members at risk as well. What you need to know about Clostridium difficile, and, and this is an entire one hour course that I present on C. difficile, so you're getting the cliff notes here. It infects a half million yearly, kills 30,000 annually in the US, 15% will die in the first 30 days. And nearly half of these C. difficile cases, as we said earlier, are antimicrobial resistant. 12,900 deaths yearly attributed to an antibiotic resistant strain of C. difficile. The biggest risk factor, as we heard, for C. difficile infection are antibiotics in conjunction with exposure to C. difficile spore contamination. And we said those spores are nearly impossible to kill. They can persist for months, even years on surfaces, flooring, clothing, shoes, everywhere and the spores can go home with you, putting your family members at risk. Anyone is susceptible to a Clostridium difficile infection. Anyone watching this video right now, the next time you take an antibiotic, you are at risk for C. difficile. And some populations are at greater risk. Those over 65, for instance, um, those that are immunocompromised have even a greater risk for developing this infection. Quaternary ammonium compound wipes, Cavicide and others, do not include disinfectants approved to kill C. difficile spores. And you would find that on EPA list K. Now, you may see on the label effective against C. difficile, 
with a little sort of icon. And when you read the fine print, it will say vegetative form. The vegetative form of C. difficile is anaerobic. It dies within a couple of hours in the environment. It's the spores that we need to be worried about. They're like the little cocoons. And again, they can live forever. My story, I became infected with C. difficile early in 2022. It followed a dental procedure, simple extraction, and an antibiotic. And 30 days later, I returned to the practice for a post-operative check. And within 48 hours of that 30-day checkup, I developed acute gastrointestinal symptoms that weren't recognized initially as C. difficile. So you can see the photo of me February 13th, 2022. Um, I was diagnosed just a few days after that photo was taken. Um, the photo of me in the center was my fourth hospital admission through the e emergency department for severe dehydration. I had a 30 pound weight loss within about 10 weeks and I did not respond to four rounds of antibiotics. I was dying. Um, at that point, I was able to locate a surgeon here in the Phoenix area to perform a fecal microbiome transplant. And that saved my life. So that third photo of me there is one day after the procedure. It's the first day I could really try real food. Up to that point, I had been on primarily a liquid diet and was pretty limited at that. It's the first time I thought in a long time, I'm gonna survive this. This was a pilot study to determine toxigenic C. difficile contamination in an outpatient uh, study. And this was in an infusion center. And they wanted to understand better the level of C. difficile contamination in these settings and disinfectants that would be appropriate for mitigating for C. diff spores. So they knew that patients entering these infusion centers that were receiving a monoclonal antibody called Zinplava were patients that had active C. difficile infection because that's one of the um, treatments. And then they had patients that did not have C. difficile coming in for other treatments. The C. difficile active infected patients, they used hypochlorite products in those treatment areas. And the non-C. diff patients, they used the wipes that were, most of us are using quaternary ammonium compound wipes. And what they found was that both C. diff and non-C. diff patients, first of all, contaminated those operatories with C. diff spores. So how did the C. diff spores get in there? Shoes, clothing, remember they're everywhere in the natural environment. Now, in the areas where the C. diff patients were, of course, the level of C. diff contamination was greater in most of those surfaces that they checked. But because they used hypochlorite disinfectants at their terminal clean, the C. diff uh, operatories, the C. diff patients that left those operatories cleaned with hypochlorite disinfectants, left less C. diff contamination than the non-C. diff patients where they used quaternary ammonium compounds. Healthcare workers on antibiotics are at risk for developing C. difficile infection as an occupational risk. Um, if you are working in a medical facility, a dental practice, and you're taking an antibiotic for a sinus infection or a UTI, you are at greater risk for developing C. difficile by the very virtue of being in a contaminated setting. And hospitals and medical centers in some of their HR departments will inform their employees that, that they are at greater risk for what they call a C. difficile occupational infection. We don't have an active surveillance system for outpatient settings and C. difficile. Right, so um, those cases may actually be greater. And this is Dr. Curtis Donsky, who is a disease infectious diseases expert at Stokes 
Cleveland VA Medical Center. And he said that he routinely informs healthcare workers when he's prescribing antibiotics that they are at risk for C. difficile by working in the environment that they are. And he said when he gives these presentations, he is always uh, commented on afterwards by someone in attendance that they will say to him that uh, they did get C. difficile while they were working and on antibiotics. You might say, well, we don't come into contact directly with active C. diff infected patients. However, antibiotics in this case were the strongest risk factor for developing a Clostridium difficile infection in healthcare workers, whether or not there was clinical, clinical exposure to these patients with infection, all right? So again, if you are working in an environment and you're taking an antibiotic, number one, make sure you're washing your hands frequently. And importance of infective of effective hand hygiene. So this is a course that I present and I've presented for uh, many years. In all cases of cross-contamination, the lack of effective hand hygiene poses a serious risk to patients, staff, and family members at home. And you may say, well, we're wearing gloves, so I don't get it. Well, your hands will continue to generate pathogens even underneath those gloves, right? So if you take your gloves off, you don't wash your hands when you take your gloves off and you reach for your phone or you're going to a keyboard, that all causes cross-contamination. The same goes with not washing your hands before you put your gloves on. And alcohol-based hand sanitizer is recommended by the CDC because the CDC knows that it improves hand washing compliance. But the fact is alcohol-based hand sanitizer is not sporicidal. It will not kill C. difficile spores and others. It will move them around, all right? Now, you may say, well, um, we don't have sinks in our operatories. That's fine. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer, still use it, but you have to use it effectively. Make sure you're using enough. Make sure you're using and covering at all surfaces according to the manufacturer's instructions. So if you're told to use it for 20 seconds and your hands are dry in five, you haven't applied enough and you haven't used it long enough. And chances are you probably didn't get um, the coverage that you need. The advantage of washing your hands underneath a sink with soap and water is that if you do have C. difficile contamination, it's going to roll off your hands, hopefully, um, and be flushed away with the water. So this poses a serious challenge to C. difficile spore mitigation in the healthcare setting if it is um, uh, just specifically alcohol-based hand sanitizer that's available. A C. aris, Candida aris, this is an emerging multi-drug resistant yeast. It's a type of fungus. It can cause severe infections. It spreads easily between patients in the hospital setting and nursing home residents. The CDC has classified it also as an urgent threat up there with C. difficile, often multi-drug resistant with some strains resistant to all three available classes of antifungals. C. aris can persist on surfaces in healthcare environments, facilitating the spread between patients and disinfectants for C. aris are found on EPA list P. Now MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. The increasing presence of MRSA in the oral cavity is an immense public health threat that cannot be downplayed given its potential for enhanced MRSA transmission and the link is there for you, and implications for antibiotic prophylaxis and surveillance. Environmental surfaces here, surfaces that we're concerned about, there are two types, environmental, um, clinical and housekeeping. Clinical contact surfaces, these are the surfaces that come into contact directly with our gloved hand, as well as spray or spatter from the patient or patient contact and housekeeping surfaces do not come into contact with patients or devices. So when we talk about clinical contact surfaces, we're talking about the handles of the light, um, the armrests of the chair or the chair itself, 
Um, housekeeping surfaces would be everything else, right? The floor, the walls, the ceiling, countertops. So they do not come into contact with patients or devices. And the CDC considers housekeeping surfaces limited risk of disease transmission. But in dentistry, we've rethought that because of the level of aerosol in our practices. And the aerosol, the very, very small ultra-fine particles can stay in the air of our operatories, our um, front office and so forth for hours because they're very light in mass, right? So they float around in our environment and they eventually are going to settle on a surface. So as I said, clinical contact surfaces here and uh, the light handle, the unit handle, the handle of the chair itself and housekeeping service surfaces would be everything else here, the walls, the countertop, the flooring, et cetera. And of course, examples of clinical contact surfaces in a dental office there for you. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but they're there for reference. And as we said, housekeeping surfaces. So flooring, countertops. And my recommendation, and in the aerosol course that I present, is that you have as little on your counters as required, right? Because it's all immersed in aerosol all day long. Dentistry is procedural and our procedures generate aerosol. And those that aerosol can be pathogenic. Okay, the following recommendations align with CDC guidelines. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for correct use of cleaning and use EPA registered hospital disinfecting products. We don't use liquid chemical sterilants or high level disinfectants to disinfect environmental surfaces. And we use PPE as appropriate. Clinical contact surfaces, we can use surface barriers to protect those clinical contact surfaces, especially those that are difficult to clean, but I'm going to be showing you hypochlorous acid here shortly, which can help you um, provide even a greater level of accessibility to areas that you normally don't feel that you can disinfect well. Clean and disinfect clinical contact surfaces that are not very protected by using an EPA registered hospital disinfectant with low to intermediate level activity after each patient. And we use an intermediate level disinfectant if visibly contaminated with blood. Okay, when we're talking about housekeeping services, uh, or surfaces, excuse me, many of you may be using a housekeeping service. And that service may be coming into your practice, maybe it's every day, every other day, weekly, what have you. The concern here that I ask everyone is, what products are they using to disinfect your practice? Are they using the same mop head uh, that they are using down the hall in a gastroenterology practice, right? Because they could actually be creating cross-contamination. So we have to be concerned. We need to ask them also, what disinfectants are they using, all right? And you might find out they're using Mr. Clean or Lysol or something. And you really wanna use something that is um, better suited for the job. So what do we wanna look for in a dental practice disinfectant? Consider environmental surface disinfectants that have met the following conditions. Again, EPA registered, EPA approved label showing the registration number, safety, technical information, how to use the product, the approved efficacy claims against TB, HBV, MRSA, C. difficile spores, and the lot. Note EPA registered disinfectants list K are recommended for use in healthcare settings where spores, C. difficile, are a concern. So when you're choosing a disinfectant, check the product labels for inactivation claims, indications for use, and instructions. And that was your background information. Now we're going to talk about hypochlorous acid. And again, for those of you watching the recording, if you have any questions, you can always reach me through our 
website. You can also send an email to support at Dental CE Now, and I'll be sure to respond to your question. Just make sure you put the topic of that question in the subject line. Okay, and again, that is support at dentalcenow.com and put in the subject line what your questions are and I will be sure to respond. Okay, so let's talk first about the history of hypochlorous acid. In 1834, it was discovered by French chemist Antoine Jerome Ballard. And he made hypochlorous acid by uh, adding a dilute mix of mercury oxide in water and chlorine glass. Now, later, hypochlorous acid was discovered as a safe and effective disinfectant. So imagine mixing, and we're all familiar with mercury, in, in our amalgams, but imagine mixing this mercury oxide with water and adding chlorine gas and discovering this non-toxic hypochlorous acid, um, which the body makes as an effective disinfectant. Later, it was discovered again as safe and effective in 19th century. Scientist Michael Faraday was the first scientist to develop electrochemical activation. So this is generating hypochlorous acid from salt water. Its properties, it's a powerful oxidant, the most powerful oxidant in the chlorine family, more so than bleach, sodium hypochlorite. It is a weak, slightly acidic neutral pH of five to seven. It naturally occurs in white blood cells. And as a side, you do want to use a product that is near neutral as possible. It is soluble in water. It is a non-toxic disinfectant. And you're probably saying, how can it be non-toxic and kill everything, including C. difficile? Well, we're going to show you the science here. Neutral charge attracts bacteria. And remember, um, these disinfectants have been used for years, and many of them are EPA approved. Now, again, we said your current wipes are probably quaternary ammonium compounds known as quats or QACs. They are not sporicidal. They're not going to kill C. difficile spores. Hypochlorous acid really in your dental practice is the optimal disinfectant. It can be used in your operatories, your laboratory, your restroom, your staff areas, your business office, uh, your doctor's personal office and so forth. EPA list K kills it all, including C. diff, SARS-CoV-2, RSV, et cetera. Non-toxic, your body produces hypochlorous acid. It's used in various forms as well for wound care, acne, oral rinses, veterinary care. I use um, hypochlorous acid from a veterinary pharmacy on my dogs, for instance. I have a dog that develops allergies now and then, and it seems to clear it up amazingly well in just a couple of days at the most. It will not fade your surfaces. It's safe to use on electronics, water lines, carpet, upholstery. It's great to use during your lunch break when you don't have patients in the practice and you can go ahead and treat your carpet and your upholstery while your patients are out. And it takes a, literally four minutes to do that. The most cost-effective disinfectant on the market today is hypochlorous acid. It's going to replace every disinfectant you currently use. The wipes, cavi wipes, uh, tablet solution, and sprayer. And we're going to recommend, and you're going to hear after this presentation, 
information about uh, dry wipes that you can use with hypochlorous acid, as well as the tablets, the solution. And then we'll talk um, towards the end of the presentation about the electrostatic sprayer. Mechanism of action for hypochlorous acid is that it kills bacteria by penetrating the cell wall, inhibiting DNA synthesis, protein synthesis, growth, and ATP production. And that includes viruses and fungi as well. So hypochlorous acid facts, naturally present in all mammals, again, we produce it, defends against all manner of pathogens and potential pathogens that attack the body from both outside and inside. It's used in wound care, as we said, food safety as well. If you go into a grocery store and you hear the sprayer come on in your produce section, they're probably using hypochlorous acid. Now, it's a strong disinfectant in healthcare settings. It's an excellent cleaning solution as well. It has to be used at the right concentration for the right duration at the right pH, however. How is a hypochlorous acid solution produced and made available to you all in the healthcare setting? First of all, we have ready to use products out there and we also have on-site generation systems. The ready to use products, this is a solution usually of sodium hypochlorite, which is uh, typically basic or alkaline on the pH scale. And it's brought down to a neutral pH by adding uh, a pH adjuster. Okay, so on-site generation systems, electricity current is run through a brine of salt and water. And then NADCC tablets. And these tablets are products that will make hypochlorous acid solutions. So you purchase the tablets and you add them to water and it produces a colorless hypochlorous acid solution. What you need to know before you purchase is it EPA registered? There should be an EPA registration number on the product label. Does it disinfect versus sanitize? Disinfectants kill pathogenic bacteria, viruses, some fungi. Sanitizers only kill pathogenic bacteria and either are EPA registered to do so. What is the contact time? So with any product, shorter is better, right? We want to turn over our operatories as soon as they're safe to do so. If it takes four minutes versus 15 minutes, of course we're going to want to go with the four minutes, right? Does it contain a surfactant and a detergent? So we use cleaner wipe, cleaner disinfectant wipes currently. If those wipes contain a surfactant, right? We're using them in the high touch surfaces. So we wanna use a hypochlorous acid product that um, may have both depending on the surface that we're addressing, but many do not contain a surfactant and that's okay if we're using uh, the dry wipe and always check with the manufacturer. Is it safe to use through an electrostatic sprayer? Not all solutions of hypochlorous acid can be, so refer to your manufacturer. Just be advised, that not all hypochlorous acid is created equal. It may not be sporicidal, so check the EPA registration number to see if it's on list K. And again, you wanna make sure it's as neutral pH as possible so it doesn't corrode your surfaces or your dental units. Make sure it's at the correct concentration to kill C. difficile spores, not just the vegetative form. And I'm going to talk to you shortly about the recommendation of using an electrostatic sprayer in addition to the wipes. This was a study that showed that disinfectant wipes, the uh, quaternary ammonium compound wipes, for instance, and some of the peroxide wipes actually caused cross-contamination of Clostridium difficile from contaminated surfaces to uncontaminated surfaces during the disinfection process. So take a look at that study. And of course, if we're using quaternary ammonium compound disinfectant, for instance, and we come across a surface that is contaminated with C. diff spores, we're literally just picking up those spores and taking them somewhere else and, and applying them to another surface. 
Okay, electrostatic sprayer technology is really exciting because it provides you with a 360 degree touchless disinfection. It creates a wraparound effect because the nozzle here at the end of that device will electronically charge the molecules as they pass through the nozzle. And it, that charge is um, causes those particles to be equidistant in the application, right? So you get an even application of the solution and it will go behind the surface as well. So that's an added benefit above using just a spray bottle. Now, electrostatic spraying reaches up to three times more surface in the same amount of time it would take with today's buckets, rags, wipes, or other infection control tools. I'm gonna show you um, a couple of videos. This is a link that you can look at. She is using a sprayer. She's using it more as a fogging device, which many practices used early on in the pandemic. But I'm going to show you a little different video here. And this is someone using the electrostatic sprayer in an infusion center, I believe, in a hospital setting. And he will turn this operatory, this is their operatory, over pretty quickly. And look at how he applies it to the surfaces. Now, he is not wearing PPE that's to demonstrate that it's non-toxic. In dental practices, we wear PPE. He's wearing gloves, but no mask or eye protection. So notice he's demonstrating you can apply it really on any surface here in this environment, which is very similar to dental practice. Electronics, the walls, the wall covering, the window coverings. The treatment chair. The call button. more electronics there as well as the uh, blood pressure cuff. And notice, again, the solution wraps around behind those devices. And the wall. And we said earlier, this can be used on carpeting and cloth furnishings, using it here on the cloth room divider. And of course, uh, another patient treatment chair. That container, I believe, treats about 2,200 square feet. All right. So again, we said the liquid droplets pass through the nozzle of those sprayers and those charged droplets will actively seek out surfaces. And when they reach the target surface, they adhere and their charge dissipates. But because they're all charged, they adhere equidistantly, okay? So you get this wraparound effect. You can apply these disinfectants in less time. You're addressing all the surfaces and you're probably going to reach 30% more surfaces. So it's very effective, very cost effective as well, and it's non-toxic. And it's going to kill everything we need to be concerned about, including C. difficile spores. Now to break down the difference here of electrostatic sprayers versus foggers versus spray bottles versus wipes. We said the electrostatic sprayers will electrically charge the hypochlorous acid molecules to create a wraparound effect. The foggers may or may not provide an electrostatic charge. So 
some of you out there may have used or may still be continuing to use foggers to address the aerosol, right? Now, check with your manufacturer there. Spray bottles will wet the surface, but they do not create the wraparound effect. And it's really ideal to spray the towel first and then apply it versus spraying a surface. Spraying the surface, you may not get uh, coverage that's adequate, all right? So manufacturers will carry hypochlorous acid wipes and they'll ship them dry and you add the solution, spray the wipe, then apply to the surface. These are some citations here for you to refer to for further resources. So the science is there and there are many dental practices using hypochlorous acid today. I think that COVID certainly brought it to light. Um, Clostridium difficile has also added an extra level of urgency. There is list K for you. Includes sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, as well as hypochlorous acid. There are some um, hydrogen peroxide products out there, but Again, you have to be very concerned about the pH because we're applying this to surfaces that can corrode or fade. So you do want to use a product that is near neutral. And hypochlorous acid, again, is very beneficial because it's cost effective. It's non-toxic. It's safe on these surfaces such as granite, leather, carpet, electronics. It will effectively turn over an operatory in four minutes. You cannot reach all of the surfaces you need to reach adequately with a tub of wipes in four minutes. Not going to happen, right? Um, and you're not going to kill all the pathogens of concern. There's some more resources for you on our website, so please make sure that you check those out. The C. diff course that I present, um, antimicrobial resistance course, infection control, is presented live twice a month also all of these are available for you on demand as well. I do want to put out a public service announcement here. If you're still prescribing clindamycin, the American Dental Association no longer recommends clindamycin for patients with a history of penicillin allergies due to more frequent and serious adverse associated um, effects with clindamycin. This includes Clostridium difficile, infection, and the number of dentists being sued because of these adverse events. So the American Dental Association removed clindamycin from the antibiotic prophylactic guidelines in 2017, I believe, in 2021. If you aren't familiar with those updates, we offer a course by Dr. Tom Palmeyer, who is the co-author of the antibiotic guidelines, he is with the American Dental Association, and this course is at no charge to you. Highly recommend it. Upgrade your uh, antibiotic protocols. It's right there for you. It is three and a half hours long on demand. You can start it and stop it. November was just C. difficile awareness month. By the way, it gets an entire month. Ant antimicrobial resistance gets just a week, so that should tell you something. And I want to thank you all for attending. I am a C. difficile survivor, and I believe uh, wholeheartedly that we need to change the manner of disinfecting our surfaces in our dental practices and consider using hypochlorous acid again. Cost effective is going to uh, kill all of the pathogens of concern. It is safe on all surfaces, um, and it's non-toxic. And again, thank you all for attending. Any questions, you can reach me there through the website. Thank you.